Welcome to the Alchemy of Ascension Summit. I'm your host, Washela Sananda, and I'm so excited about the conversation we'll be having today with Elizabeth Wood. But first, please join me in a, a short alignment process. This is so that we can get present and really become aligned and open to the information that's going to be shared today. So begin by closing your eyes and centering in your breath, breathing deeply through your heart center and into your belly and relaxing into that breath. And now bring your awareness into your heart center and the light within your heart and feel that light in your heart glowing and expanding. And now tune your awareness into a source of light far above your head. This is a source of divine masculine, and you can think of it as the sun or the central sun. And bring that divine masculine energy down through the ethers and into the top of your head. And just let that move down to the bottom of your feet and circulate around your body. And now breathe that divine masculine energy, that light into your heart, joining with the light from within. And now tune your awareness into the center of the earth, the heart of the mother earth. This is the divine feminine energy. And feel that nurturing divine feminine loving energy moving up through the layers of the earth as if on roots, like liquid crystal plasma. And then feel that divine feminine energy moving into the bottom of your feet and the base of your spine. And bring that all the way to the top of your head, spreading out into your body. And then breathe that light of the divine mother into your heart center, joining with the light from above and the light within, creating a trinity of light and a portal of awareness, of alignment and consciousness so that you may be fully aligned, aware and open to receiving whatever is here for your greatest good today. And with that, you can open your eyes and it is my pleasure to welcome a seer and scientist, Elizabeth Wood. There are so many amazing things that I'm excited to dive into with her today. I found her work and I was entranced by, um, let's see, you call it, you're a galactic and quantum anthropologist, um, which that alone, I'm just like, whoa, that's, that's, I gotta know more. <laughs> um, I understand, you know, you do a lot of work with multidimensional beings, a lot of work on the quantum level. I've heard you speak about new earth and I'm really excited to dive in. So let me go ahead and turn it over to you, Elizabeth. Please introduce yourself in your own own words and tell us a little bit about your work and what that entails. Thank you so much. What a beautiful alignment. Very refreshing. <laughs> um, so I'm very normal person who ended up with incredible gifts of being able to see psychically and went in really early on into science, 10 years of college, trying to figure out if there was a scientific explanation for all of this, which there is, mm. but, you know, step by step going in through psychology and sociology and all these different sciences that discover the human experience. And what I found was anthropology. Anthropology is the most creative science to look at human humanity, cultures, the human experience. And in my case, my specialty is futurism, it's predictive models, it's being able to look at how culture changes exactly, 
and how we can all take advantage of that change. And in the meantime, after 10 years of college, I ended up being trained for 10 years by a mystic. And now I work on the cutting edge, looking at what is our galactic position as a human race? How can we regain connection to that? Because we used to have a connection to it. It's been usurped by different various kinds of oppression. And then how do we become a sovereign race that's also one human family and connected to the galactic? And then of course, quantum physics, looking at how quantum physics affects humans, affects change, how we can take advantage of that knowledge, how we can use that to help each other heal, and how of course we can all be in that state of freedom and oneness with the source field. That's my ultimate goal. And I work with people at many different levels to make that happen as best as possible, one person at a time. So <laughs> that's where I'm at and I'm really excited about these two very new branches of science. I'm not the only one who's doing these two branches of science. Very proud to say that. And um, we're pushing, pushing it, pushing the edge of uh, spirituality and science coming together. That's really what defines our times, really, I think. Wow, I love that. And yeah, it does define our times. And I've been a longtime student of Dr. Joe Dispenza, and mm -hmm. he's kind of one of the four leaders of, he brings the science and the spirituality together. Years ago, when I started going to his workshops, he did not talk about a lot of the esoteric stuff. He was more sciencey, but now in the last few years, he's talking about giant beings showing up mm -hmm. and like all of these really esoteric things that he's seeing. And now he's just wide open about it. It's, which says to me, you know, it's, it's out there. People are talking about it. People are having experiences. They're not afraid to share about it anymore. So I love that. And um, you're also a remote viewer, I understand. Yeah. Can you tell me about like what, for those who haven't heard of it or don't know, what does that mean? Yeah. So the way I like to describe it is that we all have a psychic skill set and it's based in the imagination. The third eye works two ways. It, it works externally and internally. Most people use their third eye internally. So if I say, imagine a tree, then that's the third eye serving you internally. And you're working then imagining a tree. And everybody's gonna imagine a little bit of a different tree according to their experience. Now the third eye can also work externally and it can see a lot of information. The biggest thing that gets in the way of all of that, of course, is trauma. But if somebody who is awake and aware of all of that and is born with their third eye open, some of us are, that person is then deemed a psychic, right? Mm -hmm. So that's someone who hasn't advanced their skills necessarily to the very, very brink of what's possible. They might be seeing a lot of different beings, some closer dimensions and all of that. And so that was totally me most of my life trying to figure it out. Along the way, as I began to advance, I recognized very clearly that I was seeing not just dimensions, but different layers of 3D reality too. And what I mean by that is I can see the quantum world, I can see atoms, I can see DNA, I can see these different layers, I can see someone on the other side of the planet without them having to be in front of me and see exactly what's going on with their body because source will show me if I ask. Mm. And I've surrendered my desire to know everything. As a seer, you can see a lot and you wanna know it, you wanna understand it, but that's not the job. The job is to selflessly give of that ability to see. So when you surrender all of that, then it takes you to a whole nother level where then you're chipping away at your ego and then you're capable of doing what I call being an oracle. An oracle is someone who moves their ego out of the way or has completely shifted their ego so they're not running everything they're seeing through their ego. And that's where I'm at at this point in that whatever someone presents me with, source is going to show me all these different perspectives and all these different details and practical steps, physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, to get them to the next space. And my job is simply to shine a light on it. So as a remote viewer, that means that if someone is in Australia 
I can still see them very clearly. I can wander around any place on this planet or any planet if I'd like. And in fact, I train people to do these sorts of things. It's not actually that hard. What gets in the way is people don't believe the imagination is real. And that's, of course, something we were told early on, right? And they also get, it, trauma gets in the way too. Sometimes people have seen scary things. You know, it's going to be a half and half universe here. <laughs> and then, of course, there's going to be different reasons why people might have their third eye functioning in a certain way for them, but not the whole experience they want. Just like, for example, some people are born as empaths. Mm -hmm. So that, that heart mind, you know, brain mind, heart mind, gut mind, the heart mind then, someone born as an empath, that's wide open and they will want to have access to more. They want to be able to see what's going on, not just feel it. And if you're only, of course, depending on one of these abilities, seeing, feeling, or knowing, it's not going to get you as far as you're going to want. Being able to have a full body discernment process is what I really love to teach people, how to see, feel, and know all at once to have full body discernment, I think is one of the greatest things we could do now. Just being able to acknowledge that being able to see or do remote viewing is well established for a very long time. It's not something frou-frou or weird. It's something even the CIA was using for eons and still does. So. It's just part of the package of the psychic ability of the human because we're capable of having access. So it's all about access to those layers of reality, getting yourself really trained. You can't expect to go in with your third eye and lift a 200 pound weight right away. You've got to build it up. It's a muscle. People really do like activations and all that, but that's kind of like sh someone showing you, oh, you could lift 200 pounds. But then if you go back to the gym and you don't have any help, how do you know how to do it again? So I like to teach people one step at a time to build that strength up and be able to use their full body to help them out to see, because that's what's required in this kind of work. And if you're just using your third eye, you're going to get into trouble because you can be, <laughs> deceived. you can be deceived. And I certainly have, mm -hmm. even as of a seer as I am, I've gotten into loads of trouble. <laughs> so it's really quite interesting, that whole entire gift, that process. And that's what remote viewing and seeing is all about. Mm, I love that. Thank you for that explanation. Um, I know it's one of those things people are like, what? What is that? And um, so I, it's, I think I'm just going to jump in with this question because <laughs> I'm seeing it right now as you're speaking. So something, and I've been a long time meditator and I have really powerful journeying experiences sometimes in my meditation. So one time I was meditating and um, I saw a, an ET that looked like a gray viewing me. And I'm like, I'm being remote viewed by that being. And it freaked me out. I got scared, you know, I was like, why, why is that being watching me? what would like tell me about that what is that like is that sure. possible have you seen that and oh, is yeah. that something yeah. they do they like look at other people looking at them all the time yes <laughs> absolutely and you know another good example is we're surrounded in the angelic realms mm -hmm. of which is included of course their brethren the demonic mm. so we're surrounded in all of these interdimensional beings again all of this has been well established if it's suppressed by modern science you know mainstream science that's one thing but it's a fact that these beings exist some of them are in the 3d some of them aren't and yes we are being watched what that makes me think of actually is that well first off we're being watched <coughs> why why are humans so interesting it's, with that being, it connects to this higher level of all these other beings having an influence over us historically. Then, of course, it connects to that fear. And that fear is so important. It's exactly what you're being asked to merge with. The fear that you're being watched by somebody or something that you don't understand. A being that you haven't got to know yet. And the history of the Greys is actually incredibly sad. 
And, and so we can have a lot of compassion, but that's one of the gifts of humanity. Eventually, I see a humanity in the new earth situation when we finally heal our relationships with ourselves, we'll be able to go into a position where we can bring that compassion and that love to the table and end the fear, the fear of the other or the fear of that strangeness or that fear of being watched by beings that we don't understand. We don't understand them because we've been kept from them. Yeah. We've been kept from having good relationships with these beings. So we've all had to wing it and figure it out along the way. And then of course science says, oh, that's anecdotal. It's not, it, it's just that personal experience. No, it's not. No, it's not. Almost every single person I've ever talked to, many thousands and thousands of people over 20 years have had these kinds of experiences. Mm -hmm. That's a massive, that's a massive sample. <laughs> so if we're saying like 4,000 people, at least 5,000 people who can say, I've had these extraordinary experiences with beings who aren't human, mm -hmm. that in science is a good sample of an, of an experience that then ought to be examined more closely. But this separation between us and them is going to end, and that's what galactic anthropology is all about. How can we as humans start interacting with these beings? Next time that happens, my friend, bow to the being and say, hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I feel afraid. Mm -hmm. Admit it. I feel afraid. I feel afraid that you're watching me. What can we do about that? Merge with it. Welcome the fear. The fear is the signpost to the road that takes you higher. Mm. Every time. I love that. And it's so important. It's exactly what we're going to end up having to do because some of these beings are real weird and they don't even look anything like us, some of them. Yeah. <laughs> I've met, right? yeah. met, met beings from Andromeda where I'm looking at them, I'm like, where is your head? <laughs> like, I don't even know what part of you I'm talking to. And that's incredible. So imagine what's going to happen to people who aren't prepared for such strangeness. Yeah. It's going to create more fear and separation. But if that's, it's that universal compassion. Oh, you exist. You have a place in the universe. Mm -hmm. That's universal compassion. It's very straightforward. I'm not surprised at all that you ended up seeing someone who was seeing you seeing them and it's quite special i think and yeah. so there there's someone who knows you who's not from planet earth how interesting and that's that's beautiful thank you yeah i've actually i have i started having visitation experiences as a very young child probably about three is my earliest one and that one the very first one was an insectoid that yeah. I didn't even know that was a thing until I was an adult and I started <laughs> researching. I, you know, I would have flashes of it and um, I, you know, I had visitations my whole life from all different types of beings and all different types of um, energies and different types of bodies, different types of presences, you know, and I, I began to understand, you know, like you're saying, they're they're from different places. They're from different levels or different dimensions of um, reality. So, and yet it's all layered. It's like, it's all layered right here. And recently I, I had this experience where I did, you know, I, I, I had this idea in my mind about being watched, which, you know, yeah. you and, um, and my guidance said, you are always being watched. Get mm -hmm. over it. <laughs> Like, you know, I like yeah, that. I like that. And you know why? Because in quantum physics, the observer is so important as a factor. I mean, in science, people early on would be doing stuff and they'd be like, well, I'm, my presence isn't affecting the experiment. Right. <laughs> and then quantum physics comes along and says, well, actually, <laughs> yeah. the simple act of observing can change a photon from a particle to a wavelength or back. Wow. Yeah. So and they change the, based on the observer. <laughs> exactly. And, and so, you know, all of this is part of the source field. The source field is intelligent. It creates all these different universes in order to answer different kinds of questions. In this particular universe, the question is, what is love? 
-hmm. And so when you start discovering what is love as a aspect of that source consciousness, you're also going to find what is not love too. And the job is to go deep into what is not love to find love there anyway. And when you do that, you start to unravel the density in the dark and the things that we consider evil or whatever, you unravel it all so that you can end up finding more love. That's the job. That's why any kind of consciousness exists. But we're all being observed into existence. Outside of the universe is the void where there is no observation, so there can't be any existence. And inside, we get to be observed into existence. It creates gratitude. Wow. Like, oh, good. Source is thinking about me all the time. I'm being thought of into existence all the time. I'm important in this story. And that can be so valuable for people who feel alone and separate. Yeah, that's a beautiful concept that we are the divine thinking of itself. Essentially, we are thought in the mind of God, if you want to say it that way. And that's our, that's why we exist. So the more we unfold into that, I think the more awareness we bring to that, the more aligned we become and the more energy we are sort of more more gifts like you said are, are bestowed upon us more in alignment and trust you know there's you know, whether it's science scientifically proven or not there's got to be faith you know there's got to be trust that this yeah. is what this is the real truth the truth that's been like you said largely hidden from us there we are multi-dimensional and there are so many multi-dimensional beings interacting with us all the time if we choose to participate in that yes and here's a couple of two, two cool kind of mindsets or frameworks uh, to, to imagine when you're interacting with other people or any other beings in general first that they are source and you're talking to yourself yeah <laughs> and, and secondly they have a soul they have a soul that's beyond their ego beyond their trauma beyond whatever personality they're projecting beyond the body you might be perceiving they have a soul and that soul is of source and so i like to imagine myself as a soul talking to another soul and that whether they're aware that they're a soul or not doesn't matter I'm gonna keep talking to their soul. I'm not gonna talk trauma to trauma or ego to ego. I'm gonna talk soul to soul with people and all beings. And then being able to know then that the capability of the human is to be able to physically, not just mentally, it's a full body effort now, enlightenment is, yeah. to physically feel that oneness with source God at all times. That's the next level of enlightenment. That would be what some ancients called supreme enlightenment. Supreme enlightenment is not mental, it is physical. And that is what we're shooting for now. It's what we're being asked to do. And the earth is helping us out. She's yeah. taking us for the ride. People forget that we're on her body. <laughs> she yeah. wants us here. She wants us here. She needs the men. She needs the men. She needs the women. Mm -hmm. She needs us to continue to move forward. She does want us here. If she didn't, we'd be long gone way back in the day. She's had multiple ways and opportunities to get us off this planet, but she hasn't. And I'm always amazed. Everyone's always worried about the earth. And I'm like, the earth, <laughs> the earth knows exactly what she's doing. She's taking us into higher states because she's becoming more enlightened. And that's so beautiful. We we get to be supported in that. That's also why a lot of people feel uncomfortable right now on the planet. Yeah. Because their bodies are not in the same resonance, right? Mm -hmm. So and so being able to ground yourself on the earth and know, I look, I've got source above me, like you were talking about in the alignment, and I've got earth with me. I'm not alone. I've never been alone. Mm -hmm. You can be in a deep dark hole and feel really alone through all of your trauma but you never left the source field. You never left that intelligence, that love, that power is all there. And when people begin to recognize that inside themselves, they feel that sense of oneness, especially if they're willing to work on that trauma part. Mm, 
Yeah, absolutely. I, there's so much, there's so many directions I want to go with you right now. Um, I, you know, what I'm noticing, I'm just going to speak into this for a minute physically, you know, it's, it is so important to bring this knowledge into the body and like recognize that our body is like it's our multidimensional tool to interact, to interface mm -hmm. with this reality and all of the realities and to listen to our body. I think we oftentimes get separated from our bodies. And I know myself as when I had those experiences as a child and I was an empath as a child, but I shut that down. I shut down my heart because of fear, because I was afraid. And I went into my third eye and I, I activated that. And so I was a seer, I was a viewer, but I, it took, it wasn't until I was an adult that I was able to recognize, oh, I'm a feeler and I have been shut down. And that was very uncomfortable being shut down. And there are things about opening that back up that are uncomfortable too, but it is so much better and you get so much so much of a better, clear picture of reality when you have that heart center and your empathic abilities opened up, I would never go back to being closed down. And so that's something I'd like to work with people on and encourage people. And maybe you can speak into that. Like, how do you open the heart after, you know, when, when there is fear and when there has been trauma, how do you get that empathic um, nature open again? Yes, happy to speak to this. I'm so glad you brought it up because I'm the same. I shut my heart down really early, about four years old, when I was in Germany and Chernobyl blew, and I could see it and feel it. And I shut my heart down, but I couldn't shut my third eye down. And so I suffered a lot in that for so long until I figured out that I had actually shut my heart down and in the realization that I can't just keep stringing along by only seeing things, I got to feel and know them too mm -hmm. with my whole body experience. Then I discovered, okay, I've got to get all three of my minds on board. And so I started to work on the trauma piece. One of the things I do to help clear up the heart space, and this is good for empaths, whether your heart's closed or not. This is really a useful tool. It's one of my favorites, and I, you can use it on the fly. You can use it regularly every day as you like, but I call them heart commands. Mm. You're in command of that beautiful center of your heart, and empaths have this big, giant, wide field, but they often misunderstand their job. Their job is not to identify all the stuff in their field. That's not their job at all. The empath's job is simply to allow it to move through. That's a big moving field. It's never still. It's picking all kinds of stuff up. And the job is to say, all right, whatever you are, go ahead. Out, 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 out. Go wherever you need to go. Happiness, joy, despair, whatever. 99% of it in the field isn't even yours. It's just moving on through. So I like to use heart commands to help us out with that. So we'll do one real quick. Yeah. So we drop yeah. into the heart and we say, dear heart, please lift all of the dark or dense energy, all the negative emotions or trauma, and anything ready to go out of my whole body and field now. Then you take a big deep breath. <sighs> then we say, dear heart, please fill my whole body and field with pure source light now. Then take another deep breath. <sighs> And immediately, most people will feel a lightning. Um, other things that will happen is colors seem brighter. That makes mm -hmm. sense because mm -hmm. energetically, there's not as much junk in your field. And you'll start to have some physical effects where you feel more expansive, more connected, more still. So the empath is so powerful. And there's so many empaths here now. Yeah. And their job is so vital. They're helping to shift dead weight and consciousness off the earth mm. and out of the people. So that is a precious job. Now, I have another tip because as my heart opened, I thought I was gonna go nuts. <laughs> I'm feeling all this stuff and I'm seeing all this other stuff and it wasn't syncing up. Mm. 
And so, you know, I'd find myself like uncontrollably crying while I'm also doing seeing and it wasn't going to work. <laughs> so, at one point I went to a river and I was sitting next to this river with all this white water and this, and I'm just meditating, just trying to keep my, my field calm, trying to sync up my third eye and my heart, really not having any clue what to do. And this dragon appeared and it was a water dragon. And the water dragon said, look, I want to help you out. <laughs> Here's a cool tool to use to sync up your three minds, your brain, your heart, and your gut. He had me envision a ring of water moving in front of me. And so I like to see it moving um, counterclockwise in front of me. So this ring of water is moving in front of you and you're gonna sync it up with the sound of water or white noise. And he said, imagine it moving with your breath. So you breathe in and then you breathe out and then you breathe in and out and then let it sync up with the sound or the white light of the white noise. So you're seeing white and you're feeling the white noise frequency. And it totally worked. <laughs> it helped make all my three minds work together. And it calmed them down and just got them synced up. And I do this regularly now because in session, I usually will see a lot, but now I can feel it fully, which is handy because I can feel, oh, that quantum healing that I just did um, needs a little more. I can feel it. I might not see it, but I can feel it now. So feeling energy, you can feel layers behind things that you couldn't see before. And having those two things work together and then the divine knowing that gut mind saying, yes, this is correct or no, this is not right. That's going to be how you do discernment for anything you're doing. You could be doing this around any choice you need to make or any function you must fulfill. You can keep your full body still and in that space. So hopefully those two tips will help people move forward in this. I totally relate trying to have the third eye and heart open and the heart opening going, man, these empaths, they, <laughs> I feel so sorry for them. I don't want to be like this. I don't really feel sorry for them, but I, I can't believe how hard they have it. And so I'm so very proud to serve them, to let them know, be released of your responsibility of trying to tell everything that's in your field, trying to identify it. Most of it's not even yours. Let it go. Let it move on through. That's all it needs. It just needs your acknowledgement, whatever it is. Your acknowledgement. Yeah. You know, I think that's a huge piece and it's, it's to realize that it's not yours. And I love that. Well, first of all, the heart command and, you know, tips from a water dragon. <laughs> I can't, can't go wrong with those. I will be using those for sure. And, um, but to, you know, the body, when, when I was able to like get back in my body and open up that, I realized how much information my body gives me. Like that question I just asked you about the empath. I asked that because I felt this, my body was asking that question, like ask this, you know, it's like, it wasn't my head question that I wanted to ask this. It was my body wanted that question answered. And you start to get this feedback, you know, like this. And I love how you distinct, just, or differentiate there's a like the seeing mind the heart mind and the gut mind and that when those three are synced up you have like this full feedback system and they're all interacting with all of it all the time and that is like that gives us a multi-dimensional perspective through the body and yeah. we can't just do it with the third eye. That's not enough. Not for this 3D life. You know, if we're going to live in a body, we need to have the body online. So any tips like that for, for using the body are so powerful. I can't stress that enough. Like the body is a, a wonderful tool, a wonderful tool for interacting with multiple multidimensional beings, multidimensional realities, this reality and all of it and other people. And that feedback that you get is, is so much more when you're doing it through the body. Mm, I just love that. I think of these beautiful body machines as so precious and Having had these interactions like you with all these different beings, 
the human body experience is highly coveted, mm. highly coveted. Why do you think everybody's after our DNA? <laughs> right. And here's, right. here's why. Yeah. Here's why. Because these particular bodies are based off of some of the original DNA that was created many, many millions of years ago. There was a big old war started over this DNA because this DNA is so powerful. The beings that created this DNA were interested in doing two things. They wanted to experience and play with all dimensions at once, which they couldn't be before. And they also wanted to be able to maintain and retain memory, which they couldn't do before. So these beings created, they're called the Lyrans, they created DNA in order to be able to have these two experiences. We might call them sort of the librarians of the galaxy. Mm. And they were some of the first very original beings here in this, intelligent beings in this, in this galaxy in particular. So that became a coveted tool. And not only does our DNA afford us access to all dimensions all at once, if we're willing to do that work around trauma, it's like having garbage bags in your way. And you move all these garbage bags and you discover that you had 12 more rooms in your house that you didn't know you had because all the trash was in the way. That's exactly what I'm talking about. But our original DNA, when it was first brought here to the earth, was some of the most untainted. It was sort of the last vestige of untainted DNA that didn't have the memory of all the galactic war. So this is important because as we dig through our history, we're only half a million years old. That is baby, baby state in this galaxy. We're still babies. And we're, we're teenagers at this point, I guess. And so, you know, that makes sense that we're still very volatile. We're still trying to understand our emotional bodies. We're fighting with each other. It makes sense that we're in this position. But we only have half a million years of trauma to deal with, not... 30 million years or plus, you know, 60 million years worth. We don't have all of that. This is something that I don't talk about very much, but I think it's very important just for your particular audience, because I can feel it, that they need to know this, that it's not an endless job to clean up this trauma. It's, it's not as much as it seems. Half a million years seems a lot because we have these short lives, but that's not a lot. And how do we know that that's true? Well, some of the very most ancient um, historical texts talk about how long humans used to live. We used to live up to a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And so why did that lessen generation by generation? Trauma. Epigenetic trauma has shortened our lives. And so if we want long, long life and health, if we want our genes to be all turned on with the good stuff and all the bad stuff turned off, we got to work on the epigenetic memory. So most of the trash bags in the way aren't even yours. They're your ancestors' trash bags. And by golly, our half a million years has been pretty awful and um, full of a lot of oppression. Fair enough. So anybody who showed up at the moment is deemed instantly a badass <laughs> because you kind of wake up in this room full of trash bags and figure out who the heck you are. And here you are. You really want to know who you are. That's who you are. You're a very brave soul who has had many, many galactic experiences who signed up for this job to help with this particular experiment. And no one comes down onto this earth at this time thinking it's going to be easy. It's the other way around. This work here in these bodies, embodying all of this light and accessing the dimensions again, is some of the most greatest advancement that we'll ever go through as a soul. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we have chose to be humans now is so incredibly vital. That's how brave everybody really is. Even if you don't feel very brave right now, you picked this so that you could advance. It's not a punishment. There is no such thing as punishment. It's only advancement. And so just speaking to people's souls on that, I'm very proud to tell everybody, look, we're in this together. We're all on the cutting edge. And we're the ones writing all the new books. 
it's time to keep moving this forward. We can see what's coming. We've got to rebuild our relationship physically, mentally, emotionally, culturally with the earth. She's the one who said, I will take this experiment on. I will help them to access again who they really were. And here's a good point too. A lot of people are like, but why? Why have we had to go through half a million years of oppression? Well, very, very early on, it was very clear that humans had a lot of hubris because they had all this access to stuff. Well, we have those stories. Those stories are true. Cain and Abel, there's a very clear example of hubris and arrogance getting in our way. It turns out that with great suffering, and my life is a great example, it's been a hell of a ride. <laughs> but with this great suffering, I've been able to have compassion that I never had before. And that's actually what we're supposed to be doing in the future is to be emissaries of compassion and love. We couldn't do that very well and understand oppression and pain. And so that's why we've had to go through this trial. And it's also why all of these very awake souls like you, my friend and myself and anyone listening, that's why we're all here. So that's my perspective on that. I hope it helps people feel like they're not being punished, mm -hmm. but they're here to do a great, grand, and a very important job. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. I, um, I want to speak into privilege. You know, it's really a privilege to be here. And it's so interesting. That's what I was hearing as you were speaking. I had that conversation with my son this morning. He's 11. He's in fourth grade, just got back, you know, from vacation and he didn't want to go to school. So, you know, and he has this habit of coming up with a stomach ache on Sunday nights, like mm -hmm. before, before school on Monday. And I told him, you know, I sat there at breakfast with him this morning and I said, you need to get this. It is a privilege to get to go to school. There are people that don't have access to knowledge and learning and they don't have, they're not going to go far in life. You get to go to school. It's a privilege. You will get to go to college. It's a privilege. Knowledge is a privilege appreciate it, embrace it. I know you got to do stuff you don't want to do. We all do, but it's just embrace the privilege in that. And you know, he shifted. He shifted. That's some good mothering there. <laughs> <laughs> and I think our mother earth is letting us know the same thing. Yeah. Channeled through you and what seems like, right, your personal experience but it's being channeled through you to the divine masculine representative of your son. My son, it is a privilege to be a human being on this planet right now. Might not feel like it sometimes, but it really is because your soul has never had a better chance to advance and to understand what is love while in the darkness than this. This is it. This is one of the greatest moments in our time in this galaxy. That gave me chills. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, so it's like we have to do stuff that's uncomfortable. We have to face that fear. We have to sometimes face beings that show up and freak us out and still maintain love, you know, and, and that can be difficult, but it's all a privilege, you know, it's, it's such a fun time to be here. And so let me take that and bridge into asking you about new earth. Mm -hmm. um, can I just throw that in, in your direction and let you take it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So here's my perspective on New Earth. Um, I, I realize that there is a lot of discussion about how the Earth is going to go into certain dimensions and perhaps even split off and all these things. And I want to stand firm and say the dimensions didn't go anywhere. They've always been available. The access comes when you're willing to work on your trauma stuff. And then, of course, your lineage is trauma. Um, for example, one day my, set, my dad said, I've finally forgiven my father and I'm completely healed, which I thought was so interesting. And I said, well, then you still have a very important job to continue to work on the trauma of your lineage. If you feel that you're done with your own trash bags, 
many of us get to that point. A lot of people who are listening have been doing a lot of work on themselves for a very long time. Then you're going to hit this point when you're saying, well, what's next? It's going to be the lineage. And so what is new earth exactly? New earth is the future where human beings first, of course, have healed the relationship between the masculine and feminine so fully. They've come into oneness without usurping each other's personal cultures and communities. It's going to be based in meritocracy, a true meritocracy where people are in representation without having to be paid money and who have reached those positions of representation through merit. And so that means that my neighbor, a farmer, has just as well of a chance if he's true and he's honest and he's a good person to be able to reach a state of representation and we will have a council a council of people who are part of the galactic council and those people will have had very average normal lives and they're going to represent the average people on this planet and all the different cultures will get a chance to it's very different than what we have right now where people are basically using money to attain certain positions of power then of course we've that's the 3d <laughs> so then you know, the, the better distribution of wealth and all these things will be solved. There's already solutions yeah. that have been very well suppressed, many um, w of which have been developed by fellow anthropologists. So being able to be culturally um, compassionate while being able to represent and help humanity move forward, we're gonna have a very different relationship with the earth. We're not gonna live in houses that look like this anymore, up off the ground. We're not gonna have lifestyles that are toxic or create products that are gonna harm our planet any longer. That's the 3D part. Then of course the esoteric, the multidimensional part. People will be able to continue to help each other heal, feel each other. Their fields will get very big and connect. I've actually seen a vision where all these empaths all over the world, their fields get so big and so clear that they connect. And we have the true internet. The true internet is the psychic internet. It's the source field. It already is occurring. More and more people are sensing one another from far, far away. I'm not sure exactly where you are, but we are not near each other at the moment. <laughs> and we can still feel each other. And that is the true internet. Now, then we'll see, feel, and know each other. We'll see, feel, and know what each other wants to say and what we're all going through. And we'll be able to support without ever having to leave our yard. So mm -hmm. this is part of the new earth. Then, of course, I do see and perceive that the rebuilding of the planet will get done. We will get access to this technology that we need that's been available and hidden for so long. That's coming soon. Over the next five years, then it's going to change into, in ways that we can't even imagine. And with that will come this sense of, all right, now we're getting somewhere. And so with that then also comes contact. It con comes contact with beings. I've had other visions which I don't like to talk about the future that much because there's so many timelines and they're all true. But I have had visions where I'm walking down the road and there's a being from a different planet walking past us and we greet each other and we keep walking. And that's so like normal. <laughs> like, it's, the, it's such a normal, it was so normal in the vision where oh, well, that's normal <laughs> that there's a tall white walking past me or a gray alien or whatever, where we're living in harmony with all these different beings because Earth is really cool. We're kind of already like the United Nations of the galaxy at the moment. I mean, we've got over a thousand different beings interested in us at, at this moment. And they're all talking to each other and they're talking to some humans yeah. and a lot more humans than it seems. So... That's, that's some of the envisioning I'm noticing and, and how to get there, I think, is the most important part because that's where all the action is. It's nice to imagine or try to tap into the timelines that come, 
but you know, there's just as many timelines where we fail as there is where we succeed. And all of them are true. So it's up to us in the moment where all the action is to make sure all this is happening. We do that by working on our trauma, by continuing to develop universal compassion, understand unconditional love. There's always something in front of us that makes us think twice about all the conditions we have on our love or <laughs> makes us wonder if we should have some. <laughs> And so there's that, the, the personal work of each individual is so vitally important to the outcome for the whole, yet the sum of all of its parts is greater. So us in oneness, us getting real about the fact that we are a vulnerable population in this galaxy and we all need to help each other get to the top of the compassion wheel here, that that's the ultimate goal. So New Earth is going to take a lot of work. That's okay. We were here to get our, our chops in. We're here to make sure that we can do this work and advance ourselves in that and share it with the rest of the galaxy. Our species will share this. And by sharing it, we will embody it. That's how you master something is when you share it with somebody or something that didn't have it before. And that's what we'll be doing. Um, the other energetics around New Earth, of course, are multidimensional. I know that many of us have very deep relationships with the angelic, but if you ask them, and being someone who's had this long, long relationship with angels too, ask them, see if what I'm saying is true. Most of the angels really just want to go home. They don't want to have this war with the demons anymore. They don't. The angels really do want to go home. They want to take all of their brethren with them. That's going to be a future too, where they get to finally go home and that war can end and all the demonic oppression can finally end. So the angels have their job, of course, and everybody's got an agenda. But right now, most of us, of course, are human <laughs> and there are hybrids and we need to welcome them. They're very important. They're going to help us. There's a lot of souls who chose to be in hybrid bodies right now. Many, many clients I have are hybrids. And so with that, that comes compassion. They're very confused. Hybrids have their own set of problems. But the energy is going to be one of deep compassion and unity with the whole galaxy. We will bring that to the table. And one of the cool reasons why is not what you'd expect. It's because we have an emotional body. Most of the beings we've talked about don't have an emotional body. They can't feel emotions like we can. And that is really spectacular that we can feel emotion. Emotion is actually going to lead us to the forefront as great guides of this galaxy, no longer being oppressed. And that means that we need to take the human agenda very seriously and Notice how the anti-human agenda gets placed very easily into our minds from all different directions. All these different people saying, well, humans are, are a disease on the earth. What happens when you tell somebody that they're evil, dark, and, and that they're just a disease? They become that. And I'm here to help end that because we're not. We're not a disease. The earth does want us here. All of this corruption is due to trauma. It's due to oppression. It's due to beings and people who have forgot the human agenda. So the positive, good quality human agenda will, when that's put in place, that is our road. That's our road to this higher state and this wonderful, deeper, long lives in harmony with the planet and nature. And of course, the position where we will be honored as beings who climbed the ladder out of oppression. And that ladder is a positive human agenda. Keep telling yourself and the people around them, around you, and, and remind them to tell the people around them that they are meant to be here, that they are special, that they are powerful, that they are part of the healing of this planet, not the, the destruction of it, and that they can choose. This is why free will is so wonderful and why the present moment and all of its action is so powerful. 
So that's my vision for New Earth, and but even more important, how to get there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. I love all of that. And as you're speaking, my daughter is, she's 22 and she's an environmentalist going into geology. And so she does have this like angst about humans are destroying the earth and she has this desire to protect the earth. What do you say to someone that, ha I mean, is, is the earth going to be able to remedy like the plastic in the ocean and all these things that humans are causing? Um, how, you know, how do you address that? for yeah. the people, you know, the climate change Absolutely. and all of that. Yeah. Absolutely. I would point out to her, as I do many folks in who are are really here to help protect the earth. I mean, her soul's mission is very clear that she is a bridge. She's a bridge between the earth and the people. She chose to be a human so that she could teach the people how to live in harmony not keep running around telling them how they're doing it all wrong. Most average folks really have a hard time because they've been ingrained with these particular kinds of habits, like buying things that are going to have, you know, one stop plastic that can't be reused or whatever, or even buying into this idea that recycling is going to save the world when it certainly hasn't. Um, or, you know, buying, you know, teaching people, look, if you change what you buy, then you're going to influence through your demand. I mean, the economy is based on this concept of supply and demand. So the people really do need to stand up and say, we're kind of done. <laughs> well, we're really done. We're really done with all of these different uh, ways that the corporations and all the elite have continued to teach us to be destructive and now we're not going to spend our money on this stuff we're we want to spend money on biodegradable plastic if you want to stay in uh in in business on this planet you better get real and you better get in balance with the planet her generation with all of that knowledge is going to help teach people how to do that but it's got to be done gently slowly lovingly with compassion not with anger the anger is okay. I think she's got righteous anger. She'll want to process it and recognize that behind it, deep down in the anger is light. And in that light is going to be compassion. Well, you know, here's this person who doesn't actually know how to feed themselves because they have never been taught that Coca-Cola really is going to hurt them or Cheetos is not a good thing to snack on. And they they've been falling into an addiction pattern an escape pattern the, many of the folks we're talking about who continue to not have that connection they are full of incredible amounts of trauma and oppression so being able to teach somebody very gently through the heart hey this is going to help you to feel better one little step at a time let's help you to feel better by doing natural things that are going to be serving your body and helping you to be in harmony and grounding you. And then you'll lose weight and you'll live longer. You won't get cancer. Your heart won't fail. These things are so important, but people need to learn that it's to their great personal benefit not to use plastic anymore, that it's to their great personal benefit to understand that the smelly fun stuff you put in your washer is actually full of cancer causing smells or anything like that. This is certainly deep wisdom. So she's put herself in a position as a soul to have to understand her own anger fully. Anger, you know, Yoda is right. <laughs> anger leads to fear and fear is the cause of much of the self-hatred that human beings feel and are taught so if she's able to overcome that merge with the fear and find the compassion deep underneath all of it and really see people for what they are i live in kentucky kentucky is the most sick state in the union there are more cancers here than anywhere in the united states the poverty here is incredible but the people work so hard they work in these factories 
and it's shocking. So I go to the grocery store. I see a person overweight, very obese. Most of the people around here are because they work so hard for so little money. What do they have to enjoy? Cheetos and soda and TV. That's all they've got. Mm -hmm. And so here's this person, obese, in front of me, buying a whole cart full of this stuff for their family and themselves. I don't see someone who is in deep wisdom and knowledge and privilege. I see someone who is incredibly traumatized and has no idea who they are. And so what can I do in that moment? I compliment them. Wow, that color shirt really looks good on you. Blue is really your color. I just love your hair today. I can tell you have new shoes. Something nice. Here's this person in the line at the grocery store and I can say something kind to their soul, soul to soul. Now, did I just teach them how to not buy Coke and Cheetos? No. <laughs> what I taught them was that they're worth something. And that opens the door to more things than I can ever imagine. I've seen it quantumly that one single com compliment has saved someone's life and helped them to make changes because suddenly they were valued and they never felt that before. So to your daughter and all of those who feel angry, I understand, I understand, but the anger is an illusion. The truth is that ignorance and trauma are keeping people from making changes and they don't know how, they need help. So if you can yeah. find the answers and you can with great compassion and love, teach them and speak to their hearts, teach them from things that are important to them, you know, find the thing that somebody loves and they're gonna be willing to listen to you. Recently, I did a session for someone who my friend was like, well, I'm not so sure she's gonna like you because you know, you're not this, um, you're, you're not part of her church or whatever. But we went and visited this lovely woman and I was sitting there listening to her and she had just had knee surgery on her right knee, which meant that energetically, she kept trying to carry the weight of her whole family all the time and the weight of the world felt like it was on her shoulders. That's why her knee started disintegrating. And so I, I always just look for what do they love? What do they really love? She loves dogs. She does rescue work with dogs. So she takes these dogs and rescues them, trains them and finds them new homes. Mm -hmm. And so I began to, we started talking about the problems of the world. And of course, everybody wants to blame humanity. Fair enough. And so, I'm sitting there listening to her and I said, um, well, you just mentioned, uh, you know, how you had a run in with someone who was on drugs. And I said, when a, when a dog is, when someone comes to you and says, this dog is very, very bad and ought to be put down. Do you believe that, that the dog is actually bad? And she said, no, I don't. And I said, why, why is the dog having trouble? And she said, because the dog was taught to. Mm. And I said, humans aren't any different. And it was like, <laughs> she suddenly realized, oh, oh, she got it. This person in front of me is no different. They've been taught to hate themselves. Of course they have addiction issues. No wonder they're a mess and have demonic entities all over them and they're just falling apart. Of course. And so suddenly her compassion was taken to a whole nother level. And then I gave her a tool. I gave her some power. I said, look, you're surrounded in angels. You need to stop thinking that you're going to be the one to save everybody with all of your prayers all the time. That's really important, but you've got to delegate. Mm. I said, tell all your angels to go help these people. You don't have to be the only one. You're surrounded in armies. You have that in front of you they want to do stuff for you but you have to tell them what to do angels won't do things unless you tell them because their prime directive is not to interfere with our free will so you must tell them not only am i going to pray for this person in front of me who has this addiction issue but i'm going to send some angels to help him out too and the next day she called my friend and said does elizabeth have the gift of healing my friend's like well, I don't know what happened. And she said, 
my knee. My knee's completely healed. Wow. I went to my physical therapist 24 hours later, and he watched me walk across the parking lot, and my knee is healed. It doesn't even hurt anymore. And she said, did, he, did Elizabeth heal me? And I'm sitting right there, and I started laughing, and I said, no, no, it's an angelic gift, because you truly understood what I was saying, that it's not the people's fault that they've been suffering in the way that they are, that they need support and help, just like an animal who's been taught to be bad needs help too. And because she understood that, and because she stopped carrying the weight of the world on her body, and let the angels have some charge over this because she can, then the weight of the world got, came off of her knee so it could heal in 24 hours. So that's a good example of, a, it's a microcosm example of where we're at right now and what people can do for each other. We must teach people how to love and live on the earth, how to feed their bodies, how to love themselves. This is how new earth will come. Mm, beautiful that was that was just so well delivered <laughs> thank you thank you and I think we need to hear that and remember that like we just have to have love and compassion that's what helps that's what heals and berating or you know bringing someone down or making them feel bad for something they're doing never works it doesn't we've got to lift up first so that we can all feel valued so Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything Thank that you, you shared and everything you're doing and everything you continue to do. Mm -hmm. And so that is the end of this conversation for today. And I just want to encourage everyone watching to take note of what impacted you the most from this conversation today. Did you have an aha moment? Did something really strike you as a wow, you know, something you were just moved by or inspired by? And if so, um, let us know. Okay, signing off now. I appreciate you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and namaste. Namaste.